in the early days of Gojek, there was a lot of resistance to our services. The most common form of that resistance in the early days was actually by motorcycle taxi mafias. So you would have like these areas that are essentially controlled um, through violence by specific you know, area mafias. And when we start having drivers pick up orders and pick up passengers, these people uh, would actually physically assault our drivers. Um, you know, we've had everything from like bricks thrown at uh, our drivers to, you know, knives um, and machetes being brandished at them. And I think it would have been easy for us to say like, hey, you know, you know, they're uh, they're all contractors, they're third parties that, you know, let them let them kind of just sort it out. But instead, we uh, we actually hired private security. So we actually work with private security companies to help our drivers in those situations, you know, to, to help to help kind of like, you know, extract them out of these these sticky situations. And so we actually ran a fairly big private security operation uh, for a fairly long time. Welcome to Lenny's podcast, where I interview world class product leaders and growth experts to learn from their hard won experiences building and growing today's most successful products. Today, my guest is Kevin Aloui. Kevin is the co-founder and former CEO of a company called Gojek, which I've always been fascinated by. You may recall a former guest, Crystal Wajia, who was head of growth at Gojek, and I've always wanted to get more of the story. Gojek is infamous for their scrappiness, their unique approach to ops and growth, and as being one of the first and most successful super apps in the world. They've also long been maybe the biggest startup in Indonesia and all of Southeast Asia. Kevin and the story of Gojek have a lot to teach founders in the US and all over the world. And so I was really excited to sit down with Kevin to dig into the story. He did not disappoint. You'll hear all kinds of wild stories about them having to hire a private security team to protect their drivers, having to build their own cash distribution centers to pay their drivers, plus how they won in large part thanks to their early investment in brand, why it's important to do the hard things as a startup, also why super apps are surprisingly overrated, and much more. Enjoy this episode with Kevin Aloui after a short word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Coda. You've heard me talk about how Coda is the doc that brings it all together and how it can help your team run smoother and be more efficient. I know this firsthand because Coda does that for me. I use Coda every day to wrangle my newsletter content calendar, my interview notes for podcasts, and to coordinate my sponsors. More recently, I actually wrote a whole post on how Coda's product team operates. And within that post, they shared a dozen templates that they use internally to run their product team, including managing the roadmap, their OKR process, getting internal feedback, and essentially their whole product development process is done within Coda. If your team's work is spread out, across different documents and spreadsheets and a stack of workflow tools, that's why you need Coda. Coda puts data in one centralized location, regardless of format, eliminating roadblocks that can slow your team down. Coda allows your team to operate on the same information and collaborate in one place. Take advantage of this special limited time offer just for startups. Sign up today at coda.io slash Lenny and get a thousand dollar startup credit on your first statement. That's coda.io slash Lenny to sign up and get a startup credit of $1,000. Coda.io slash Lenny. This episode is brought to you by Rose.com. The world runs on spreadsheets. You probably have a tab open with a spreadsheet right now, but the spreadsheet product you're using today was designed decades ago and it shows. They live in silos away from your business data. They weren't made to be used on a phone. And if you want to do even the simplest automation, you have to figure out complex scripts that are a nightmare to maintain. Rose is different. It combines a modern spreadsheet editor, data integrations with APIs and your business tools, and a slick sharing experience that turns any spreadsheet into a beautiful interactive website that you'll be proud to share. If you're writing a report on a growth experiment, you can use Rose to do your analysis on data straight from BigQuery or Snowflake. If you're deep diving on marketing, you can import reports straight from Google Analytics, Facebook ads, or Twitter. Or if you're working with sales, you can natively plug Stripe, Salesforce, or HubSpot directly into Rose. And when you're done, you can share your work as a beautiful spreadsheet that's easy to read and embed charts, tables, and calculators into Notion, Confluence, or anywhere on the web. I've already moved some of my favorite spreadsheet templates to Rose. Go to rose.com slash Lenny to check them out. That's rose.com slash Lenny. 
Kevin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Lenny. Uh, we've we finally made it happen after uh, a few weeks or months of going back and forth. Yeah, I'm really excited to finally meet you and to dig into a bunch of stuff. I think this is going to be a really unique episode. I don't often have founders on the podcast, especially founders of companies that are not based in the U.S., in this case, Indonesia. Uh, Crystal Wajia, who was on this podcast previously, one of my favorite guests, is just like, Lenny, you got to get Kevin on your podcast. And so here we are. I'm glad to be in a, in a small group of uh, category of people that you invite. Thank you. I'm, I'm a huge yeah. fan of uh, what you do. Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. And to would redirect to you, you are the co-founder of a company called Gojek. Many people listening have never heard of Gojek, especially people in the US. So just to start, can you just like describe what is Gojek? What do you all do? And then also, I think more interestingly, is just like the scale of Gojek. I think people in the US, their mind will blow once they hear the scale you've reached with this company they probably hadn't heard of. So Gojek started as a motorcycle taxi uh, based service. So it's a kind of a uniquely Indonesian thing where uh, we have millions of motorcycle taxi drivers in uh, all of the urban centers in Indonesia. And so we, we started uh, with a very local problem. Uh, and the first product uh, was a on-demand super app, uh, if you will, where you could ask someone on a motorcycle to give you a ride, send a package for you or buy something and deliver it to you. Um, this then evolved over the years into you know, a more general on-demand consumer super app that also included you know, car drivers and other services ranging from the ones mentioned to grocery deliveries and payments and financial services. And today, uh, we took the, com uh, the company public about a year and a half ago after we merged uh, with, uh, with Indonesia's top e-commerce platform. And uh, we've managed to also expand outside of uh, just Indonesia, where today we have about uh, 2.7 million drivers across Southeast Asia. Uh, we've completed about 3 billion orders uh, last year. So that's 3 billion orders. So that the scale of, of our region is, is often um, under underappreciated, um, where we also have about 15 million merchants um, doing you know, general e-commerce but also you know, restaurants on our food delivery service. Um, and on that IPO, um, you know, we were pretty proud to say that you know, it was Indonesia's largest uh, IPO uh, of all time, uh, where we raised over a billion dollars at something like $27, $28 billion uh, in terms of valuation. And these numbers you shared, 2.7 million drivers, 30 billion orders, or 3 billion. Three, three, three billion. How would that compare to like an Uber or Lyft? I, I don't know what the what what their latest numbers are, but just in terms of the numbers of people and the numbers the number of activity, I would place our scale among the largest uh, U.S. companies. That's pretty wild that there's this company out there that a lot of people didn't know about that is basically of the scale of Uber and Lyft. In terms of you know volume, I would say that we're we're up there with Uber uh, globally. And definitely larger than 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 Lyft. I don't remember how many drivers are uh, in the U.S., uh, but but it's definitely uh, we definitely have uh, more uh, drivers in the region than than all of the all of America. Just to kind of like check this checkbox, you said it was a super app. What are all the things that GoCheck does? Just whatever you want to share, all the things that you can do. From the point when we had the most services, we had everything from um, you know ride hailing to you know, package delivery to food delivery to grocery deliveries um, we had moving services on you know uh, you know trucks and vans we had on demand uh, massages cleaning services you could get your hair done um, on, on 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 gojek you could order movie tickets uh, you could get a loan you could pay for things i think at, at our peak we had something like near 30 different services uh, all in all in one app i think it's like you're officially a super app if your founder can't even remember all the things that you do right now <laughs> yeah I, yeah definitely uh definitely I, I i i would challenge anyone uh within the company to be able to name all of our services that we've ever had on the app uh, because it, it, it was pretty wild at one point and uh, I, i'd love to kind of talk a little bit about my thoughts on, on super apps at, at some point during this uh, during this session because I definitely um, have some mixed views over it as a product strategy uh, as, you know, as we've gone through that whole cycle. It might be actually a good time just to jump into it. I know that oh. I was actually saving that for later, but this might be a good time. And part of the reason I think this is really interesting is 
if you open up Uber these days, it's like mm-hmm. like 40 things that they're offering now. Elon mm-hmm. and Twitter's talking about turning Twitter into a super app like payments, communication, messaging, all these things. So I think it's mm-hmm. like a really interesting trend that continues to pop up here in the US. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I would absolutely love to hear your perspective on, on super apps. Okay, I'm going to come off a little strong on this, but I, I am kind of annoyed at how much it's being mentioned these days. It's, it's really popular in VC consultant analyst uh, 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 circles because it, it sounds really great on a strategy deck you know, because you know, all of the things that are really, really appealing, they will talk about you know, lower customer acquisition costs, you know, higher attach rates to different products. Talk about you know higher you know retention across different services, um, uh, the ease of you know cross selling and upselling. You know all of these things sound great, but in reality, a lot of those benefits don't pan out. And and one probably really good example that that I like to reference is that I remember one of our products uh, was mobile um, you know phone uh, top up and recharge. Uh, you know in Southeast Asia. A majority of people are on prepaid plans instead of postpaid plans. So everyone basically buys their minutes and their data plans um, up front in the beginning of the week or the beginning of the month. Um, so we had a product which was a mobile top up uh, product. Um, and so the reason I mentioned this specific product as, as a really illustrative point on super apps is that it's a product that 95% plus of our customers. A need because they're all on you know prepaid plans, so it's a very very relevant product. And we had our UX research team actually look into why the engagement on the product wasn't as high as we thought it should be. So one of the questions uh, that, that our UXR team asked our customers was, was like, "Hey, do you know uh, that you could top up your mobile minutes and buy data on the Gojek app?" And only about forty percent of our customers, like 30 or 40% of our customers knew that this product existed. And that completely blew our minds because one, it's a product that is relevant for all, all of our customers. Two, it was literally there like on, on one of the six buttons in like on the, on the home page. And I think the, the, the insight that we got here was that there kind of needs to be a unifying concept across all of your services within the app for your users to be able to think about your product in a sensible uh, uh, way. You know, and, and, and for us, the way that our customers thought about us was that was they thought about the driver. And so when we launched, you know, when we went from ride hailing to package delivery to food delivery to grocery delivery, your know, customers really understood that. And, and we didn't have to sell this idea to our customers that you had all of these services under one app because they thought about the Gojek driver. That made sense. You can easily cross sell somebody from a, a ride hailing customer to a grocery customer or a food delivery customer because they understood the unifying factor there being the driver. Uh, but then when you start doing other things that don't have that unifying factor in terms of you know the concept that a customer has when they think about your service, it starts breaking down. So you know, one one other fun fun UXR uh, uh, insight here was when we launched uh, massage services. So you know, we we had uh, at one point though we've already sh- we we've shut it down a few years after. We had massage services where you can you know order a masseuse to come to your place. And a a, a question that many of our customers asked was that, oh, is the driver going to come into my house and give me a massage? And for us, like that was insane. Like, of course not. Like, you know, this you know, our drivers are not trained masseuses, but that was the question that people asked because they thought, like, oh, this app is an app for these driver-related services. So if there was a massage service, I'm assuming it's that same man uh, um, who's going to give me a massage. And so, you know, I think this kind of illustrates the importance of having these unifying uh, uh, concepts that are easy for customers to think about the multiple different services. It's not. It's not as simple as just saying like, oh, we have a lot of engagement. We have a lot of eyeballs at a service. And then you have a super app that makes sense for customers. And so that whole nirvana of like high of, of lower CAC, higher retention uh, that are on these great strategy decks uh, often don't pan out because you kind of have to then resell this idea of like, oh, this is another service that you can use. And, 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 and that's another a bit of investment that you have to actually put in in terms of advertising and 
and customer education that increases the, those customer acquisition costs. And it also leads to design constraints because there's only so many ways you can display a whole bunch of different services uh, that actually have little to, to, to do with each other, which is why when you see super apps a day, it's kind of like this giant menu or this giant grid, um, which does limit uh, the, the, the design decisions that you can make, um, which is unfortunate uh, because, you know, if you kind of actually, um, I think it's, it's an unsolved problem at this point. It's a hilarious story about the massage of <laughs> product. Sounds like a lot of startups are going to have some issues um, scaling to new products and trying to become a super app. I want to shift a little bit and talk about brand. I did a little research on you ahead of this chat. I was watching, I watched your like Marshall graduation speech and oh. a few other interviews you did. And something that came out of your previous writing and talks is just how much you care about brand and how much value you put into brand. And they just have a lot of opinions about the importance of brand. And to, to me and to most people, brand is this like really squishy thing. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to know what exactly to do to build your brand, when to prioritize it, how to prioritize it amongst other things you're doing, especially early on. So I'd love to hear your advice for founders that are listening and just like, what should I actually do around brand? What's your advice for how to tactically do something about brand? And also just, you know, why do you think it's so important? Mm -hmm. I, I do agree with you that it, it, it is kind of this squishy thing that, you know, most people um, see as an afterthought, maybe because it is kind of this squishy thing that that's hard to hard to define. But I, I'm a I'm very, I'm a very, very big believer that the two most important things in a consumer business are product and brand in that order. And I don't think I need to sell the idea, uh, especially to, to your audience, um, that product is absolutely critical and probably the most important. But yeah, the brand as an afterthought is, is, is definitely one of the areas where I think um, there's a giant missed opportunity for, for consumer tech businesses. And I almost, you know, I, I get why we kind of opened the session by talking about the size of the business uh, to give an appreciation of the scale for audience members who might be unfamiliar with us or with the region. But I wish I didn't have to start there because we actually started as a very scrappy company where we were by far the underfunded player. And, and without brand, um, that, you know, we probably would have never gone to escape velocity beyond that scrappy uh, uh, stage. Uh, we've maintained our leadership in Indonesia. And I, through a lot of the things that we we actually did uh, uh, on the on the brand uh, side, and to give you a sense of you know how scrappy uh, we had to be uh, in, in in competition, you know for the first six months after launching our app, you know, we had only raised about two million dollars, and our regional competitor had already raised two hundred fifty. So they had literally like um, more than a hundred times more capital than we have. So it's easy to kind of talk about you know the, what we built as this kind of, you know, giant business, but we came from a place where we were seriously underfunded. And I think a big reason why we got, we survived uh, was that we built a great brand for, for our consumers and for our drivers and for our merchants. And I'm, I, I think that great brands create associations in their customers' minds that transcend the typically transactional or utilitarian one that most people have with businesses. And they become part of uh, one's identity. I think some of the best in class examples of these are probably, you know, all the Apple fanboys and fangirls, uh, Nike sneakerheads. You know, for 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 these uh, individuals, you know, the brand becomes really part of their a big part of their identity and and, and their loyalty towards the, the the products of the company. You know, go beyond just like, hey, you know, uh, 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 go beyond a, a a relationship that can easily be swayed. Uh, just through discounts or or other or more features that 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 that, that other uh, competitors might have, and so I'm I, I I'm a really really firm believer of how important this is because you can see it if you step out of the tech bubble uh, uh, for a second you can see that there are so many great companies out there uh, that that you know really rely on the strength of their brand um, to, to to build these you know fantastic businesses and to to create great experiences for for their customers. And you ask, you know, what, what are kind of the things that one can do? Um, uh, I think for us, you know, we, we invested a lot in, uh, uh, in our brand uh, across multiple areas. And I think one, one specific area that I think is really, really important is that 
you create consistency across all customer touch points. And so, you know, branding is not just, you know, a cool logo, cool advertising, um, you know, fun, fun imagery. Uh, but it's, 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 it's really about, you know, the impression that a customer or a user has uh, with your product and with your, with your business. So having that consistency across all customer touch points is, is really important. So, you know, how you write copy and advertising and in the app, uh, how you even design the app. Uh, but we were the first company of scale to kind of have ads that don't take ourselves too seriously. Uh, you know, we make fun of ourselves. We make fun of, uh, um, you know, our cultural observations of Indonesia. And again, to kind of just build uh, this overall feel that like, hey, we get you. We are, you know, we are part of the the, the overall culture of, of of Indonesia. And I think even going beyond, you know, the, 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 the more aesthetic or um, communication oriented investments, we also leaned into cultural artifacts um, uh, in our product features uh, to, to kind of, you know, really, uh, you know, build this, this, this brand that is part of, you know, day-to-day -day culture. One of my favorite cultural artifacts is that in, in Asia, it's fairly common uh, to send food as gifts to your loved ones or, or, or maybe people you're interested in dating. So people would send over like food as gifts uh, uh, to, you know, their, their, their romantic interests. And, and so when we launched our food delivery service, a lot of people were actually using it for this. Like, you know, I'm going to send it to um, my, uh, 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 my boyfriend or my girlfriend uh, or the person that I'm interested in dating. And so it became this whole cultural phenomenon of, of like sending go food uh, uh, for, for these people. And we kind of lean into it in our product feature where all of our, all the other uh, players uh, in the market at the time basically only allowed you to deliver food to your home or your office. But we actually allow we actually created a feature that allowed you to, to choose a delivery point that was far away from where you were. Um, There's a lot of uh, there was a lot of reasons why other companies didn't do didn't allow it at the time because it's like oh you know it might be used for fraud and 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 stuff like that. Uh, but we leaned into it. We leaned into it and 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 allow and actually created features that allowed to put your pickup point far away from where your actual location was. And then we kind of just you know had fun with this whole idea of go food dating. And so, yes, it's kind of part of branding, but but thinking about branding beyond uh, just like marketing communication, but but actually be as you know being relatable and being part of the culture and being sensitive of of of, of what that culture is, um, I think was was something that you know we did a really really well in the early days that allowed us to continue maintaining leadership in spite of the fact that our competitors had more money, which meant that they could offer more discounts, they could off offer more incentives to drivers. But we, we really kind of lean very hard into, you know, being not just a utilitarian commodity, which is what a lot of people would say is, uh, 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 is the nature of our business to, to, to some level of accuracy. So just to get even more concrete, um, one takeaway from what you just shared, which is interesting, is the first part of figuring out how to approach your brand is what are like, what's like the personality of your product for you? You said it was like. We're just like of the people, we're like you, we're here to help you make your life easier. And then that informs the copy, the messaging, be a little, uh, I forget how you described it, but just like almost like bad grammar and stuff, just because it like relates more to people. Yeah. And then some of these product launches that connect to that. Uh, so maybe if there's anything else you want to add there, that'd be interesting. And then what's like, I don't know, one or two moments that most help build the brand. I know you're kind of famous for like having helmets and jackets on the drivers that help spread the Gojek brand. Is there anything else that just like, wow, this was really effective to build this brand that ended up dominating Indonesia? Yeah, the jackets and helmets piece, I think is really, really important for two reasons. One, the more obvious reason, which is that because they were just all over the streets of um, uh, many cities in, in Indonesia, you know, people were familiar with the imagery and the name. But I think it's also really, really important that people saw what was happening. So, you know, you if we just, if we were like, I don't know, an airline and we branded a bunch of people on the streets with, you know, our brand, it's, yeah, sure, you know, it, that might help with, you know, brand recall and people might know about uh, uh, the name. But what was really, really powerful um, was that, when people would be seeing uh, uh, these uh, drivers with their jackets and helmets, they would be seeing passengers on the backseat as they were stuck in traffic, right? So I'm stuck in traffic and I'm seeing these people whiz past me 
uh, with this, you know, with, with, with this imagery on them. And immediately I, I get that association like, oh, I'm stuck in traffic, but I could be out there cutting through traffic on a motorcycle. Or you see them like carrying packages or delivering food and you immediately get like, oh, like these are guys who, uh, uh, who can deliver food or deliver packages for me. And so it was like this beautiful combination of, you know, one, just having that imagery and, and, and having that uh, visual everywhere as a reminder of the brand. But more importantly, it was also uh, a, a physical kind of, it was, it was a physical reminder of the service of what we do and of how we can help you. Um, and so looking for these opportunities where, again, customers can kind of make that connection between you know, the, the, the logo and the colors and the name uh, with actually what the service is, I think is, is, are the opportunities that, that I would say uh, uh, people should look out for. Uh, they're rare. They're admittedly, they're, they're, they're quite rare, uh, which is why, um, in my opinion, it, the laziest, uh, 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 kind of branding tends to to to, to be the most popular. Um, you know, just you know, put your name and your you know copy on a billboard or uh, on a CPM or CPC campaign. Uh, but there are these opportunities, I think, on 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 being able to reinforce the the value proposition of your business uh, in a way that is you know beyond just kind of visual recall. And I think that. That I think was 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 why you know that specific anecdote is something I like to talk about because it was really really one of those special uh, things that reminded people uh, on, on on why we're here. Yeah, I think you tweeted that it was one of the most important things you ever did as a company is decide to put these logos on the helmets and jackets. Reminds me of Lyft's pink mustache, which went away, yeah. but felt like mm -hmm. a really important way for mm -hmm. them to differentiate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, totally, totally, totally. You talked about how scrappy you've been. And I want to dig into that a little bit more. I think there's like US startup scrappy and then there's like Gojek scrappy. And uh, it'd be fun to hear maybe a story of two just to illustrate how mm. ridiculously scrappy you were as a company early on, especially. One thing that we did in the early days that was absolutely crazy was that you know, we, we were uh, one of the pioneering companies, one of the pioneering technology companies in Indonesia and in, in, in Southeast Asia. And so, you know, we came into a environment where a lot of the things that maybe companies or, or, or people in more developed economies take for granted, um, for example, having electronic or digital payments, that was something that actually didn't really uh, exist that much uh, uh, when we first started. And so we had a problem of actually trying to pay drivers because you know, drivers, um, you know, every day we would be, you know, paying out incentives or, or, or just having, you know, customers pay with, you know, their, 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 their credit cards or their stored balance. And then we'd have a challenge in getting our drivers to actually uh, uh, be able to take that money out for, 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 for their earnings. And in the early days, we actually had cash booths. Uh, so we actually had um, physical spaces with like a vault and, uh, a cash sitting in the vault where drivers can show up, you know, show that, oh, I'm, this is my driver ID. I'm, uh, and this is the, 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 the balance that I have uh, 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 with, with you. Please give me the cash. And so we would have these places, these, these actual physical locations where there would be lines of drivers essentially taking cash. And we eventually, you know, figured this out of like, okay, we're, we'll work with a bank and integrate with an ATM network and, 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 and all of that. But, you know, in the early days, you know, we just, did it ourselves of, of, of being basically of building essentially a mini ATM network, um, which is a, I think, you know, a, I, I think even that sounds too fancy of what it was. It was just, it was literally like a booth with a vault with cash in it. And, and, you know, we had like at the time already, you know, tens of thousands of drivers uh, all across Indonesia. Another uh, scrappy story um, that uh, actually Crystal reminded me of uh, recently that we did um, was at the time there was a lot of uh, fake driver apps out there um, because you know we didn't uh, we didn't uh, have uh, all of the security investments that um, we eventually made you know things like uh, code obfuscation and, and and better API security that wouldn't allow for you know these fraudulent driver apps these basically third party driver apps to co to connect to uh, to our platform so there were a lot of these drivers using. Uh, these third-party driver apps uh, that were doing things that 
so they were kind of doing unsavory things like, you know, stealing driver details, uh, you know, getting some of them even as um, bad as like financial details so that they can then uh, at some point, um, you know, drain driver funds. And, and the way that they did it, uh, the way that they convinced drivers to actually use these apps was that they actually added some features that at the time we didn't allow. So things like, um, uh, you know, we wanted drivers to be uh, to be conscious of what was happening on the app. And so we would actually ensure we would actually make sure that drivers would you know push the accept order button. We, we, we made sure that that was the only way that drivers could accept orders. But this app had a, um, a functionality that would automatically accept orders as soon as they kind of came in. And so they actually it was kind of this interesting situation where they were doing things that, you know, were fraudulent and, 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 and you know, were not safe. Uh, uh, for for the integrity of the platform, but at the same time, they were also providing some value uh, uh, to, to 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 the to the people who were using them. And so, you know, at the time, we had to make a decision of like, okay, we need to we need to nip this in the bud, right? And one way that we could have done it that would have taken time was really invest in a lot of the technical uh, uh, security aspects of it. And but you know, we didn't have the bandwidth. Uh, to be able to do that, you know, engineering and security talent is actually super, super scarce in Southeast Asia at the time. Still is today, but at, at, at that time, extremely, extremely scarce. And so we ended up making the decision of actually copying those features. So we actually saw all of these like third party fraudulent apps. And instead of like, you know, building a whole system to kind of prevent them from being built or, 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 or preventing them from being worked, uh, preventing them from working on the platform, we just said, hey, let's take their top two or three features and let's build them into our app. And that actually significantly reduced uh, the number of users uh, uh, on these third-party apps um, just by kind of, you know, having this mentality of like, you know, if you can't beat them, then, then join them. And so uh, and, and that I would say, you know, that wasn't a philosophical decision uh, uh, or, or a principled decision. It's actually a decision made out of necessity because we, we simply couldn't build all the, the capability to, to combat these apps at the time. Are you hiring? Or on the flip side, are you looking for a new opportunity? Well, either way, check out lennysjobs.com slash talent. If you're a hiring manager, you can sign up and get access to hundreds of hand-curated people who are open to new opportunities. Thousands of people apply to join this collective, and I personally review and accept just about 10% of them. You won't find a better place to hire product managers and growth leaders. Join almost 100 other companies who are actively hiring through this collective. And if you're looking around for a new opportunity, actively or passively, join the collective. It's free, you can be anonymous, and you can even hide yourself from specific companies. You can also leave anytime, and you'll only hear from companies that you want to hear from. Check out lennysjobs.com slash talent. These are hilarious stories. Uh, like you had to compete with these like uh, rip-off jailbroken uh, yes. fraudulent apps, and then you had to build a cash box uh, network all over the all over the country that's mm -hmm. amazing i knew there would be good stories in this question and i'm glad you delivered there's also this like feeling of uh within gojic of just like doing the hard thing and not like you just ex shared a couple stories of this versus mm -hmm. like the simple like a lot of startups are like let's do the simplest thing feels like you guys lean into the hard thing why is that where'd you where'd that come from and then is there any other story of something that you did that was like we'll do it the hard way I really don't like the idea of moats. Again, one of the concepts that uh, uh, gets thrown out a lot by by strategy type folks of, of having, you know, what's your what's what's the moat of your yeah, of your business or, or or your product? Um, and and usually people are looking for an answer of like, oh, look at this uh, this capability, or look at you know this feature, or look at this distribution uh, uh, partner, or you know. All of all of those kind of things, and I don't believe that any modes are durable over time. Eventually, with enough time, all modes can be crossed. Um, and and I think one you know so called moat that doesn't get talked about enough is the fact of is the fact that um, you're able to do hard things uh, because hard things are hard. Um, and just simply doing things that are hard. As long as they prov they create value uh, to your customers, um, actually is a position that makes it harder for 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 your competitors uh, uh, to be able to uh, win over your customers because it's hard to do those things. And 
probably another example of, of, of doing something that sounds you know, very difficult um, was that in the early days of Gojek, there was a lot of resistance to our services. And, and one, of the, one of the forms of that resistance, one of the more common, most common form of that resistance in the early days was actually by motorcycle taxi mafias. Um, so you would have like these areas that are essentially controlled through violence uh, 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 by specific you know, area mafias. And when we start having drivers um, pick up orders and pick up passengers, these people uh, would actually physically assault our drivers. Um, you know, we've had, uh, you know, everything from like bricks uh, thrown at uh, uh, our drivers to, you know, knives um, uh, and machetes being brandished at them to, you know, just, you know, physical uh, 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 altercations, like, you know, literally like um, mobs of people. Um, getting into these brawls, and there was a, a lot of these kind of things that actually happened on this in, in, in the streets of Jakarta at the time. And you know, I think it would have been easy for us to say like, "Hey, you know, you know, they're uh, uh, they're all contractors, they're third parties, that you know, let them let them kind of just sort it out." Uh, but instead, we uh, we actually hired private security. Um, so we actually work with private security companies to help. Um, these situations to help our drivers in those situations, you know, to, to help to help kind of like you know extract them out of these these sticky situations. And so we actually ran a fairly big private security operation uh, for a fairly long time, you know, until it became common to have Gojek drivers, you know, do all of these things across uh, cities. We actually worked. We had we ran this you know very operation intensive thing uh, just to make sure that. You know our drivers could be as safe as as as, as possible, and it showed our commitment uh, to the driver community. It showed our commitment that you know we cared. And again, you know, going again, going back to that earlier point around you know having that branding association. You know, drivers uh, knew that hey, you know, we were we just we we weren't just a platform that just kind of let that didn't care. You know, we 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 actually cared about their safety, um, and and that helped build that goodwill, even as competitors start coming in and paying more money, uh, you know, we still had a lot of loyalty uh, within the driver community because of things like that. How did you actually have a security person on a motorcycle? Were they like pretending to be the rider and then just like get out and punch him in the face? <laughs> uh, a minority of, 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 of situations were like that. But a lot of that was just like, hey, having like a, a, an, an on-call service where they could just you know, dial a number um, and somebody within a, you know, five, 10 minute distance would actually show up. Um, and so we would have these like these, these patro uh, patrols effectively in, in, in specific hotspots where, you know, if there was uh, uh, a situation brewing that, you know, they would they would instantly or almost instantly show up uh, to the site and help um, diffuse it. I love that you have this like super app that's doing all these things for people. Plus within the company, you've built all these mini businesses, like a whole bank to mm -hmm. pay people, private security company. There's probably some other. I, uh, Crystal shared a story of you guys rented out a stadium for oh, drivers right. to collect all the drivers and give them phones. Uh, yeah. Okay. This is great. Yeah. That I think That's... is kind of like a, probably one of the hallmarks uh, of, of, of this region in general, where, um, you know, I have no doubt that you know, what we were building and what we are today is a technology company. But I do think that in the early days, you do have to be a lot more operations heavy. Um, and, and then I think that that lends to that scrappiness uh, because there are a lot of things that, you know, to solve elegantly and, 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 and technically will take a lot of time. And there, and, and it just kind of over-focusing uh, uh, on on those type of solutions, I think would 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 be doing your your customers a disservice because there are opportunities uh, to make things a lot better um, just through um, probably more innovation in 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 operations to kind of uh, kickstart things uh, until you have the more elegant, scalable, uh, technical or product solution. That reminds me that at Gojek you held tons of different roles throughout the time you were there. You were. Mm. Uh, obviously, co-founder, your co-CEO at one point, de facto CPO at one point, CIO, CFO, 
yeah. I heard that you were writing like push notification copies I mean, and became a dri yeah. driver at one point just to keep things running. Uh, so it feels like another good example of exactly what you're talking about of just doing the, the hard thing in, in the operational component. I mean, yeah, so actually, you know, I, I, I did have a stint as an amateur uh, performance marketer in the early days of Gojek. You know, I would, I would you know, write copy, I would upload ads onto Facebook and, and, and Google and try and do my best in kind of optimizing our, our, our online marketing spend. But um, I, I think I did all of those things, not because I wanted to be scrappy necessarily, but uh, I, I do think that as, and this is probably most relevant for founders, less, less for executives, but you know, I think for, as, a, as a founder, I do think it's really important to understand the work um, that needs to be done in order to see what excellence looks like. Um, and, and for us, you know, again, we, do, we, we came from an ecosystem where the availability of experienced talent was relatively low. Um, and so for, for me, it was very hard to be able to just say like, oh, like, let, let's hire person X from organization Y with you know, job description Z. Uh, and we know that they probably can can deliver um, because, uh, you know, again, the, the talent availability was really low. And so a lot of times I needed to, I felt like I needed to understand, okay, what is this job? Um, what exactly does it entail? What is, and, and, and seeing how bad I am at it uh, allowed me to understand what good looked like. Um, and so I, I held a lot of those roles just because, you know, I, I wanted to understand um, every part of the business as best as I could uh, in order to then find somebody who could do it, you know, orders of magnitude better than, than, than myself. Uh, I would say that is true for all of these roles, except for being a driver. Uh, I think being a driver, you know, I wasn't trying to understand um, uh, 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 what excellence as a driver looked like. Uh, obviously, the drivers do a really challenging job. And, and I think I just wanted to understand uh, what that role was like to kind of build a lot more empathy uh, towards the uh, the job and and um, make sure that our product was catered uh, towards what those needs were. So when I, we first launched our uh, car uh, ride hailing services, I think I was the first actual driver um, on uh, on the app, and yeah, and I I would every now and then would be a driver, and and, and I remember in the early days um, when I actually picked up a customer, you know, it was this lady. Um, and she she put in her destination as a as a mall, and so I you know I went to her I went to this house, um, you know, and I knew that okay I needed to drive to this mall, but then this lady comes out with this like giant bag, um, and so I had to like you know hop out the car, take this giant bag, you know, put it in my trunk, um, and then you know I, off we went. And in the middle of the the drive, she's like, hey, you know, um, I need to drop off and, and do my laundry. Uh, on the way to the mall and you know I just had to okay cool like we took a detour you know I lugged this giant bag uh, out of our trunk and and helped this lady you know, do her laundry and then we went to uh, uh went to the mall and I got very little money out of that experience and and you know it was an instant but this this is kind of eventually what led to I think the a lot of the support I gave to our driver teams when they were pushing for, hey, we need more waiting fees. Uh, uh, we need to add, you know, multiple stops uh, 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 in order to make sure that, hey, you know, a lot of this extra work was actually compensated. And, you know, it was something that you know, I obviously um, experienced personally. And, and it was something that something that I, I definitely uh, was excited about as a, as a set of, you know, product features and principles uh, when it came to building our driver app. It feels like having to do that ends up being a feature, as you said, that you actually experience yeah. a lot of these challenges. And you said yeah. the really good point about knowing what to hire and what these people are going to actually do. Yeah. That is, uh, yeah. that's interesting how that often turns into a good thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know you also have a pretty interesting journey into tech. What can uh, you share on that? So I am basically a failed finance professional. Um, you know, I, I wanted to, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do in my life. And in you know, 2000, 2005, uh, which is when I um, entered college, you know, the hot, sexy thing to do was finance. Um, and I guess that was what I wanted to do. Um, and you know, I went, you know, studied finance, uh, and then the crash of 2008 happened, and I graduated in 2009, so it's probably the worst time to 
be a, fi- or try and be a finance professional. And so I went through a really challenging time there, but eventually I got a job at a boutique investment banking firm. And that was, I thought like, okay, now I'm, I was set uh, for life. You know, I got the job that I wanted. Um, I'm working in finance. Um, but I then, uh, long story short, uh, I was not very good. Uh, I was not very good. Uh, my, my, um, my bosses thought I was underperforming. I didn't feel like I was performing and I kind of left, uh, that, that field, that field that I thought I was, I built my, my entire, I guess, future dreams and identity around. Um, and you know, after I, I did that, I decided to take a bet in, in Indonesian technology because, you know, this was like to, you know, when all of this was happening it was around 2010, 2011, and it was, you know, it's starting to see, uh, the, the development of the current technology giants in the U S uh, at the time. And I, I thought that, you know, it'd be, it'd be pretty cool if Indonesia ever had a technology industry to be part of it, uh, at the, at the ground floor. And so I moved back in 2011, uh, and you know, it was super early. It was really, really early at the time, uh, where, you know, the level of talent, the level of funding, the level of product market fit, the number of people who transacted on the internet was, was also still super low. People still saw the internet as a place for, you know, chat apps and social media. And so the level of belief that people had in the space at that time was, 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 was pretty low. You know, people didn't think that real businesses, um, and real valuable products could be built. Um, especially be built locally. Um, and so taking that bet uh, was something that I, I think, you know, it, it really panned out for, 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 for us to kind of be really, really early uh, in this space, uh, which, you know, today has become very, very vibrant. The scene in Southeast Asia has become, you know, I think one of the most exciting uh, um, spaces in, in, in technology in the world to date. But at the time, it wasn't obvious. And, and, and being able to see that development uh, I think was something that was really, really important to me because um, it really shows you what's possible in a very, very, very short time. And I think it's something that probably people in technology in the U.S. Uh, can relate to you know, the people who've been working in the space for like 20, 30 years. But being able to see those early days uh, for me is was just you know really, really valuable. And I think uh, uh, was an experience that I you know definitely, definitely cherished. It's really hard to just build a company outside of. Silicon Valley, and it was even harder back then. Uh, like COVID and remote work almost made it the easiest it's ever been. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of the fact that you were so far away from the Bay Area informed the way that you built this company, the scrappiness that you that you talked about. I'm curious if you have any advice for a founder who's trying to build a company now outside of, say, the Bay Area or just U.S. in general, based on your experience. Yeah. Look, uh, it was it was super hard back then um, because it was particularly hard because Indonesia is such a valuable market. Indonesia and the rest, I would say primarily Indonesia just because of its scale. But I think overall Southeast Asia was just, it's such a valuable market. Uh, and it was interesting for global companies to want to win it. Um, so we had, we competed with global and regional companies, but the local talent and funding ecosystems were, were really underdeveloped. So that, that that challenge of like having to compete with the best in the world, you know, for 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 customers in the market, while also not having all of the resources available within the market to be able to build products and companies that can compete, uh, was the re- was I, I would say one of the most challenging parts of building, um, probably in, in markets that are um, atypical uh, or or outside of Silicon Valley and maybe some of the other kind of technology centers in, in, in the world, like China and India. So some of my learnings, uh, uh probably there on, you know, on, that I, you know, for, that I would, you know, take going forward, um, is I think we talked a lot about being scrappy, uh, in the beginning, you know, we were a lot more ops heavy than tech heavy and, and, and doing the things that don't scale, uh, uh through other means, I think. Uh, is definitely something that is absolutely necessary uh, if you're building outside of these main you know, technology hubs. Uh, another thing I would say is you need to get good at remote work really early. And, and, and I think today that's kind of become a lot more you know, prevalent uh, uh, as, as more and more uh, people have experience with, with, with remote work. You know, for us, uh, we, we built an engineering center in Bangalore in 2015. 
And this allowed us to compete a lot better uh, uh, with the global giants because we had access to you know, a really deep uh, talent market in India at the time. Um, but we were really early in this whole remote work thing uh, because it wasn't common uh, for, for people in our region, but also globally to have um, so much talent concentration outside of headquarters. Um, and I do believe that companies who want to compete against world-class competitors outside of you know, these you know, technology centers like Silicon Valley need to be good, become good at remote work really fast uh, because uh, you know, getting that talent um, probably means uh, having offices that are or, 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 or individuals who are outside of uh, your home market or your headquarters. Um, and probably the final, um, I would say, tip here is you know, don't just copy um, because Gojek was not like an Uber clone, uh, uh, even though that was kind of how you know, some investors or analysts talk about us. Uh, you know, we were focused on a solution that was uniquely uh, an Indonesian phenomenon, the, mo- uh, the motorcycle taxi driver. And this led to both product and you know, branding innovation. Um, the, on the product side, you know, we were an on-demand super app uh, because we saw that you know, a human being on a motorcycle could do a lot of things. And so we built a product around that idea. And, and hence, we ended up with a super app even before uh, super apps were really a thing. And then that branding point that we talked about a little earlier about giving our drivers, you know, jackets and helmets uh, so people could see them zip around town, which actually doesn't make sense if you're a, a car ride hailing service uh, because, you know, you couldn't, it, it's not very easy to brand a car and, you know, the drivers are inside the car. Uh, but all of our competitors at the time, uh, when they first entered the motorcycle uh, uh, ride hailing space, didn't brand their uh, uh, their drivers because they came from a car centric view, um, and so again, understanding you know your unique market dynamics is also really really important if you're building uh, uh, outside of um, you know these these uh, um, these technology centers. We've been chatting about Indonesia and Southeast Asia. I'd love to hear just like what should people know about that market. Um, we've chatted about what you guys have built and a few other companies here and there, but. Like what companies should people be aware of? What's happening? What's the latest? What's exciting? Yeah, I, I think on specifically Indonesia, Indonesia is, most people don't know that Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world and that Southeast Asia holds almost 10% of the world's population. Wow. But beyond, you know, the macro uh, uh, picture, I think it's also, you know, we've experienced a, a, a pretty unique uh, level of, um, pace of adoption for 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 products uh, with great product market fit. Um, so you know, products with great product market fit grow tremendously fast uh, in this part of the world. In, in 2015, for example, you know when we launched our app, you know we grew more than 100 percent month on month for the first 16, 18 months. Um, so we more than doubled um, every month for more than a year. That is insane. I've never heard of that. No, I, and you know, our our investors at the time, uh, Sequoia is one of our investors at the time, told us that this was the craziest the craziest growth story they, that they've ever heard of uh, in in the world. Um, and it's I wouldn't say because of our necessarily because of our brilliance. Uh, uh, it was a combination of how you know in 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 Indonesia and Southeast Asia there are a lot of these things that are obviously broken and, and, and could be improved with, with better technology and better products. But also, you know, we also have in this region a very young population who are excited to try new things. Um, and so if you find a solution that really resonates with a lot of these common day-to-day problems, the adoption curve is, is just absolutely insane. Um, and I think it's one of the things that are, that are definitely unique um, to developing regions like, like, like this one. Um, one company uh, uh, that, that's really, really interesting, for example, just to give a flavor of um, the type of off-the-wall, seemingly off-the-wall uh, um, product uh, or, or, or company being built in this part of the world, uh, there's a company called eFishery. Um, and what they do is um, they basically create a closed-loop ecosystem for fish farmers. And currently, I think they're only operational in Indonesia or they're recently expanding beyond Indonesia. You know, they help 
uh, farmers uh, uh, feed their fish through this um, uh, this IoT smart device uh, that helps you know measure the amount of like fish feed that needs to go into uh, the ponds, uh, but they also then help uh, farmers do things like get financing uh, and also sell uh, their um, their produce uh, out to local or or even regional or global markets. And it's a company doing like something like a quarter billion dollars in revenue, and it's it, it's profitable and it's basically a fish farmer, uh, a, a closed loop um, ecosystem. And you know it, it's pretty wild that something like 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 this exists. Um, but it does it does speak to uh, I think again what I earlier what I said earlier about the hunger that uh, the population have for you know better solutions and if you can find uh, these better solutions you can really build companies of very meaningful scale uh, very very quickly. So at this point you've stepped down as CEO you're you've stepped down from the board. What's next and uh, how does how does it feel? Yeah, I'm still kind of on this journey honestly of like how, how, how you know how how does it feel. Um, I think that, you know, it is, you know, like building Gojek is by far the most important professional experience and, and, and frankly, one of the most important life experiences I've had. It's, you know, made me a, a way, way better person, actually. And now that I've, I've stepped away, I am not as bored or uh, as aimless as people would expect after having such a kind of all-consuming thing um, uh, uh, be be part of my life experience. Um, what's next? Honestly, Lenny, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I don't have a plan uh, uh, at this stage. Uh, I, I do some angel investing on the side. I you know, work with uh, other founders to be able to, you know, maybe just share, you know, some of these experiences that I, um, that, that I've that I shared today, um, and and just kind of figuring out, you know, um, what are the, I guess, figuring out what makes me happy and what kind of, you know, what, what are the kind of activities that I find rewarding. I don't know, you know, maybe I'll start another company uh, at, at some point. I think that's my default, uh, but I think right now I'm just kind of taking things easy and 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 and, and you know, trying to figure out, you know, what my another problem I guess that I could kind of be obsessed about. You've earned that time to explore and look for new problems. Is there anything else you wanted to touch on before we get to our very exciting lightning round? No, Lenny. I think I think we've 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 covered a lot uh, uh, today, and um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you for uh, for the time. Amazing! It's absolutely my pleasure. Uh, and with that, we've reached our very exciting lightning round. I've got five questions for you. Are you ready? Yes. Let's go. What are two or three books that you've recommended most to other people? What you do is who you are. I think that was the, uh, the second most popular Ben Horowitz book, but I'm really uh, I'm really obsessed with you know, building interesting and engaging uh, cultures. So I think that that was that's one. Another is um, a classic marketing book. Again, we talked a lot about branding today. So um, there's this book called uh, How Brands Grow by Byron Sharp. Um, I think it's a. I don't agree necessarily with everything in it, but I do think that. Uh, it's a it's a great primer on 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 how to think about branding and and marketing. Favorite recent movie or TV show? Favorite recent movie, uh, The Menu, uh, and favorite recent TV show, uh, Netflix show is uh, Cyberpunk uh, twenty seven seven uh, Edge Runners. Oh wow, I haven't heard of that one. I oh, you should that. check it out. It's okay. super cool. Check it's super out. cool. Go check it out. Yeah. Favorite interview question that you like to ask? Tell me about a subject or activity you've been obsessed with for a long time. What do you look for in an answer that's like, okay, this is good? I want somebody to basically almost pitch to me an obsession they have that makes it me uh, uh, interested uh, uh, in, in, in knowing more into that subject. And I, I'm, the more obscure, uh, the better. Uh, and the more pa- the more passionate they are about an obscure thing, uh, uh, even better. And I think you know, it, it shows people's capability to be really passionate about something and, 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 and sell something and, and, and think about something in a very uh, structured and detailed way. What are some products that you love and have recently discovered? Two products, I think, right now that, I've, I've, that I, I found absolutely delightful. Uh, one is the Arc Browser. Uh, I know that it's... it's, it's uh, gaining a lot of traction out there. But I'm a, a very chronic tab hoarder. My, my 
Chrome tabs are just all over the place. Um, and I love that they've uh, figured out an, they figured out an, I, I would say the best approach to kind of tab management. Um, and there's just a ton of little delightful, like awesome design details in the, in the, uh, in the app that I, I think is just really, really cool. And it's a browser. Like when's the last time there was like a really, really cool browser that came out. Um, so I also love the ambition that the company has. Um, second product, uh, Steam Deck. Uh, I'm a huge gamer and I, I think it, it is probably, I would say, the best game platform to actually uh, build on the vision of, of, of truly portable mobile gaming. I love your point with Arc for uh, tab hoarders. I also used to have a lot of tabs, and I love it just auto-deletes them. It just yes. disappear. <laughs> and it forces you to lose your tabs, and it works out, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Final question. I'm curious what comes up for this one. What's something you've recently changed or that you've heard of someone at Gojek recently changed in their product development process that was maybe minor that had a tremendous impact on the ability team's ability to execute? One relatively minor thing that I thought had a lot of impact with execution is being very clear that whoever is accountable for the result should also be the, the, the decider. Uh, I found that a lot of literature out there says that product teams should be this communal best ideas come from everywhere group, which I think is well-intentioned and absolutely everyone should contribute ideas. But I think not having it be super clear who is accountable and, and, and who is deciding often slows down execution a lot. And I think you know, when we switch to making it really clear that who was the decider for um, any kind of product development process, uh, I think our execution definitely improved significantly. Amazing. Kevin, thank you so much for being here. Gojek is such an interesting and important story. And I feel like most founders can learn something from the story. So I was really excited to bring you on and to hear a lot of these uh, wild stories that you shared. Um, two final questions. Where can folks find you online if they want to reach out, learn more? And how can listeners be useful to you? I am uh, at uh, Kalui, K-A-L-U-I uh, on Twitter. That's also my email, Kalui at gmail.com. Um, I would always be happy to, to chat about Gojek or, or, or just generally anything uh, uh, technology related. Um, again, I'm not, I have nothing I'm working on uh, at the moment. So I just would love to jam with, with, with cool people. Amazing. Thank you again for being here. Thanks, lady. Thank you so much for listening. If you found this valuable, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Also, please consider giving us a rating or leaving a review as that really helps other listeners find the podcast. You can find all past episodes or learn more about the show at Lenny'sPodcast.com. See you in the next episode.